Hello, standoff. It's day three of our <coughs> keynote presentations. Actually, yesterday we had some changes in the infrastructure. You know, the attackers have attacked uh, the oil refinery twice, uh, but actually the defendants have been able to defend that, and you'll just uh, learn about that from the main stage. And uh, Sergei Gardejcik is our first speaker on machine learning infrastructure and its vulnerabilities. Please stay tuned. Hello, everyone. Uh, Any time of day, I welcome you. I'm Sergei Gardejcik. Oops, just one sec. Once again, I'll start again. I'm Sergei Gardelchik. I live in Dubai and work in Abu Dhabi. In my free time, I actually teach in a university, a harbor space uh, in Barcelona. And I do create some noise in the Red Zero team group. I yet have another hobby. I am in for cybersecurity and I've worked with different teams uh, with uh, Hacking Odyssey, for instance, and uh, and we actually break different things and explain how to protect them. In my previous live lab, I was in positive technologies and the Kaspersky lab came up with different services and I had made some input in positive hack days and I uh, really enjoy positive hack days being uh, gr uh, actually growing with the standoff, uh, turning into a stand-out event, uh, excuse this little pun. And uh, it has nothing to do with me, by the way. Uh, I actually speak about my hobby, and it has nothing to do with my professional activities. All the bad jokes, all the uh, non-responsible disclosures uh, are my personal problem, and it's also a personal problem of uh, Anton Nikolaev, Denis Kalegov, Marie Nijak, and uh, Raman Palkin. These are the people who have made a huge input into the research I'm going to talk about. And uh, if you would like to learn about uh, the new publications of ours, uh, please uh, keep the finger on the far pulse on our websites, SCADA. Uh, scatter and uh, github and uh, you can see the urls leading there on this particular slide those of you who have seen me previously might have seen these slides uh, so sorry i'm going to repeat that but that's what i like it i like them to have uh, in different presentations so what was really an important thing to make us think about machine learning and artificial intelligence. Actually, many years ago, we were asked to have a security assessment of an infrastructure of uh, closed circuit TV and surveillance, uh, which did have all of the so-called artificial intelligent, uh, intelligence elements. Uh, we called that Big Brother CCTV, and we started thinking about how we're going to break it because, you know, we need to think about how we're going to break it before actually breaking it. You, there is thinking involved in to breaking. That's true. And one of our teams uh, did say, okay, it's uh, AI, so we're going to take adversarial example. We're going to have a video stream, a physical picture, which will help us uh, disturb the classification of uh, a model. You know what adversarial example is all about. Uh, and there is a separate presentation during the course of the standoff uh, section. So the guys decided to conduct a famous research uh, resulting in a patch, physical patch, which disturbs and destroys the classification of uh, identification of a human in the video flow and uh, uh, the face cannot be extracted uh, from this video flow and the face of a person cannot be sent for recognition further on, something like that. But uh, other guys uh, uh, that were very reluctant about AI, they decided to make it simpler. What they did was uh, taking some professional hacking 
lessons. And we know we are professionals in security, and security starts with physical security. So we came up uh, with a very sophisticated uh, device made out of uh, my Aeroflot uh, bonus card. Uh, nobody needs, you know, these Aeroflot and uh, aircraft bo bonus cards. Uh, we don't travel much by air these days. So by using these plastic cards, uh, we just uh, broke into one of the spots, which is broken to one of the spots where that system was deployed. And uh, then it all, all followed with some classical examples. We found uh, a video camera and we connected it into a hub uh, in order not to be caught red-handed. Then we decided to knock to the doors to the switches. Then we'd be able to reach to the storage and uh, we just cascaded it uh, down through the whole infrastructure and we'd been able to hack that so-called artificial intelligence without these uh, state-of-the-art uh, mathematical models. <clears throat> we just uh, did it very simply. Why am I telling this to you? Why am I saying that? We could have started with the adversarial example and we just broke there with the use of the plastic card, uh, like schoolboys. You see, because artificial intelligence, uh, you know, people sometimes focus on the uh, security of a model, but in actual fact, the infrastructure of artificial intelligence uh, plays a very important role in the learning process. And here, we would like to share some examples with you and share our experience. Before doing something, we need, just need to give a definition of this something. And this cybersecurity definition, you know, everybody knows this. Uh, I have been preparing for CI SSP some time back in the day in 2003, and everybody was saying that confidentiality, integrity, availability, that's what, uh, that, that's the holy grail, that's the holy pyramid. Uh, uh, confidentiality rules, but we also need to have availability. We all know all these things. But I remember <clears throat> in the beginning of 2000, uh, you know, actually in the beginning of 2010, to be precise, there was a big discussion uh, there's something interrupting. I stopped here in Sergey. ICS, Kata, it continues. And uh, some researchers and some researchers and uh, the standard stipulates that uh, uh, 6243 they say in that standard that all of these uh, features do apply but you just need to put them upside down because the availability of the information is super important uh, okay we say let's just take all of these three things we just put them upside down and uh, here we have this discussion around machine learning and AI, cybersecurity, and everybody's saying, okay, it's the same thing, all of the three features, but let's just say that integrity is uh, the most important element. And uh, let's just uh, do this cybersecurity uh, as usual. And previously, when we were tackling cybersecurity of SCADA systems, uh, I did have a, some kind of a misconception of misunderstanding of why would I have to put these cubes in a different way. What's more important? So it seems like it reminds me about it, that we just put everything upside down and we do hope that it's going to either give us some new marketing taste or by flipping everything upside down, we'll just immediately understand uh, how to defend machine learning, for instance. And these ideas of mine, when we were looking through the presentation, they say it reminds us about this pyramid. You know, it's interrupting. It's interrupting. And also, we keep fundamental things in cybersecurity that uh, how doesn't really matter how many times you flip them upside down, they will just remain the same, just like a pyramid. So I've been defining this cybersecurity for myself for quite a long time. So I have uh, heard about, you know, I've heard from Jay Smickens 
James Mickens uh, keynote, there was a very interesting definition, a very short one, but a very precise one. He said that cybersecurity goal is just uh, ensure that systems do the right thing, um, even in, in the presence of uh, malicious inputs. Uh, the system should operate even if data is thrown into it in the wrong way. So confidentiality, integrity, uh, r resilience, uh, fault tolerance are sec secondary. We just need to understand uh, first and foremost what they impact and what effect they have. And I like that definition very much because back in the day, I remember uh, and yet another definition that this mission-centric uh, cybersecurity approach like the military have, you have a mission, you have a mission, and uh, coming from that mission, you identify what can prevent you from doing this uh, very effectively. So for physical systems security, it was uh, considered that uh, it's uh, a situation when a physical process like, for example, a, a locomotive mo moving, a steam-powered train moving, uh, it works uh, with no dangerous failures. So it's a control object which operates with no dangerous failures, but uh, with a set of economic efficiency and reliability. There is no disaster if we stop the train, but somebody may lose the money, but uh, the train is physically safe. And of course, uh, we just need to think about reliability under this adversarial influence. And everything happens with this particular adversarial influence uh, from a group of other people. Other people, it's important here because the effect of nature, the effect of other things has been taken into account uh, already, but the human effect, uh, like evil Russian hackers, have not been taken into account that much, but we need to think about it as well. And knowing about that, uh, we have a question. So, economic efficiency and the dangerous failures and reliability level. I really like uh, this particular video and I would like to show it to you. So here is a question. What we have seen? the result of a cyber attack. The system has stopped uh, acting like it should. And as a result of these bad ac activities, a failure had occurred. You know, even physical impact was used there. So what, what about the robot? A humanoid rowboat. How can we define what's uh, physical failure, economic damage, etc.? Let's think, think about threat model. There are plenty of um, threat models existing. I spoke about them all in PhD days a couple of years ago. What I like there is uh, Mr. Lee model where he splits these threats into three levels, uh, data integrity, security, modal security, and uh, the so-called uh, implementation security. In a modal, these are the things uh, related to the framework security and some logical flows. Uh, if we are talking about data protection, it's a uh, possibility of putting a backdoor in a model, adversarial machine learning when we use it in order to cheat on a model, etc. It's an interesting uh, 
diagram, but in practice, I actually use other models, NCC group models, and uh, uh, these colleagues of mine came up with that model, and I'm showing a link which leads there, and they have uh, given me some libraries for Microsoft uh, threat modeling tools, which has not been updated for a long time, but it's very convenient, uh, just like a set of cubes. Uh, uh, for construction from which you can make up a model for machine learning, a model of threats for machine learning. My experience tells me that in many cases this model for artificial intelligence uh, is uh, very much, uh, is very, is not significantly different from other systems. We have these cubes and these cubes uh, have uh, these uh, less determined features. This adversarial attack in computer vision, you just need to make sure that uh, it exists. Uh, you can't protect uh, from it 100%, but you have to take measures like filters or anything. So basically, uh, what we have here is this general idea, general assumption uh, that cybersecurity of artificial intelligence is very close to security of physical systems because what we have here is a system which impacts our lives and uh, speaking in terms of machine learning it's very commonly used in transportation for example the uh, unmanned vehicles uh, autopilot and in this uh, system uh, apart from cyber security we just uh, need to add some errors which are related to machine learning. But a, a very important moment is the uh, machine learning infrastructure on which everything is based on. And uh, once we have heard a voice from above or from below, what doesn't really matter, from somewhere uh, we we're, we're just stunned with this idea that we just need to scan all these internets for AI. We very much like scan the internets. We very much like uh, sensors sensors and we like shodans but we are not so, somehow satisfied with their results because what they show is completely irrelevant and we've made up uh, our grinder framework uh, which has been living for many for, for for quite a long time it started back from a a, a, a different pr project to where we were working with the software defined uh, networks and this project actually allows us to use uh, different uh, mach uh, search e engines uh, like shodan sensors to get preliminary l results of the uh, systems and do the exact fingerprints so as of uh, grinder we've got ai finger which contains quite a lot of fingerprints uh, for the systems which are related to artificial intelligence. And when, then we've scanned all your internets. And here is the list of what we have decided are the components of machine learning, starting from frameworks and databases, because sometimes when you stumble upon this you can find out that some kind of framework is using it and some application is using it and you can pull out something really interesting from that here is um, a link to that article and in our blog we have uh, uh, a lab experience of how to do this uh, internet scan with the use of grinder and I did publish that some time ago. And here are the approximate results of what we've ended up with. Uh, in actual fact, what you see here, uh, the components of uh, artificial uh, intelligence and machine learning uh, are ominous, and there are plenty of them there. North America is the leader. Uh, China is a little bit behind, but they've got their own frameworks of which we may not be quite aware. Uh, so, I think they are not lagging behind that much, followed by Europe, uh, Western Europe, 
uh, followed by some other countries uh, to a certain extent. Uh, then we've got some detailed information here, and you can drill it down uh, as precise as each particular framework. What we've been able to find, well, it was expected, but uh, we like these results, uh, and uh, we found out that from the database um, and uh, up there, and we have, for example, Amazon buckets and WS, they give us uh, pretty good results. You just uh, use this metadata and uh, use particular fingerprints understanding, aha, uh -huh, these are the charts related to data annotation uh, systems and machine learning pipelines. Uh, and uh, you can drill them down and uh, find something in there. And uh, yet another expected thing, uh, knowing that uh, everything is just put in the so-called containers, uh, this NVIDIA, if you work with NVIDIA DJX, uh, all of the infrastructure is uh, based upon Dockers. You do not install these components. Uh, uh, you just uh, use this NVIDIA subscription uh, and get this TensorFlow Docker. For example, if you specialize in data, in speech recognition, it's automated. Uh, you don't need to use CUDA for that. Everything works uh, straight out of this box. Uh, but uh, with standard st settings, if you apply it with standard settings, you apply the standard vulnerabilities. And there are plenty of Dockers related to mach uh, ma machine learning. Uh, very often there is no particularly strong authentication protection, and you can just ring uh, to all those uh, apps uh, with no problem. Different pipelines, uh, for example, NVIDIA Digits. It's a system uh, for end-to-end -end learning. Uh, for example, when you, can, when, when you can take raw data, you can put annotations, you can check for their quality, then you can um, do the training, uh, then deploy the production, and up there on this production, do something else. Uh, models, data sets, and put it into a different uh, pipeline of uh, video processing, for instance. Like any machine learning uh, in pipeline, there is no uh, security whatsoever. If you drill down there, you get access to everything. You get access to raw data, to the annotations. You get access to this uh, model, which had been trained at the GPU uh, server. So you can do bad things or good things. You can uh, notify the developers that they shouldn't have done it like that and should have been more careful. Um, TensorBoat. TensorBoat is omnipresent. There are hundreds and hundreds of them there on the Internet. And uh, basically, Google is being quite uh, honest and openly saying in the release notes that TensorFlow and TensorBoat are only for internal communications and they don't have any security at all. So please do not connect it to the Internet. But a lot of people do connect it to the Internet, and uh, we can find TensorBoat, and you can find out that there is someone in real time is training this model, and you can, you know, be quite compassionate about uh, this mismatching, uh, or enjoy if this model is working fine and uh, the mistakes are going down. Uh, speaking in terms of doc Docker, we are speaking about Kuber and uh, Kuber Flow. Kube Flow is an excellent system which can help you optimize the orchestration of uh, these Dockers and TensorFlow. They are also on the internet. Uh, they are with these. Uh, notebooks uh, through which you can drill down. If you get access to that, you can get to the application level. So you've got all these classic applications and vulnerabilities that everyone is aware of. There is nothing new, there is nothing interesting but the result. You can get access to this interesting cluster and do something on it. We have uh, published uh, these results in uh, 99, 
um, I'm sorry, not in 99, in 2019, to be precise, and there was a preliminary model, and the preliminary version was done in 2018, and uh, the guys decided to scan this Cuba flow, and the Docker management system, and they started uh, putting the dockers in there on a mass scale, and by doing mining of uh, cryptocurrencies, those uh, servers are real powerful, everything is ready for that, so you just uh, get one and uh, you have a docker and it's mining there and everything works smoothly. So if we just uh, take a look at these uh, applications, uh, can we really find uh, an ML server of machine learning on the internet? Uh, well, for example, we have uh, checked uh, into Showdown and uh, tried to find out what it knows about NVIDIA. You know, NVIDIA is making excellent uh, servers, of course, but uh, basically it's garbage. We have uh, made more details about that and we found a server uh, which actually explained through Showdown that uh, it's got uh, NVIDIA V100 uh, with 16 gigs of memory. We uh, got very interested about that. Uh, it was a pretty good piece of hardware. We started uh, digging it and it seems like it turned out it was a system somebody was just mining cryptocurrency on it. Well, of course, it's a little funny to mine cryptocurrency in 2019 you using GPU for that, but uh, maybe this person has got unlimited electricity supplies, power supplies. But still, uh, we got somehow interested about that and we started thinking, how can we find a real good machine learning server? Seems like that NVIDIA V100 are installed on NVIDIA DGX1 servers and uh, there are like eight of those uh, inserted there with a very nice spec with 32 gigabytes of memory and this piece of hardware is a re has a real good price. It started selling at $130,000 or even $140,000 and it's got a pretty good hash rate. You can brute force some passwords by using this piece of hardware if you can, of course, afford it for $130,000. Uh, so we decided uh, to find this item on the internet and hack it seems like it turned out real simple. You just need to go through the documentation to do all that. This system has got a, a, a very interesting access uh, with a complicated password. Uh, and this account has a complicated password, but the, after the update, this password remains and is not deleted. Uh, but to scan and to brute force the service on the, inter in, on the internet is kind of uh, offensive uh, with a detailed uh, fingerprint. So we decided uh, to take a simpler pathwork to take a look at other protocols uh, and find, found out that the, there is SNMP. And it seems like uh, scanning SNMP is not offensive. Everybody does it. So we started looking for SNMPs with a non-standard, not public-private, but uh, QCT admin as a community string. Uh, and uh, of course, we were not too much surprised. We found uh, more than one. We found more than one. Uh, and, and if you make this uh, request in private, they give out quite a lot of information on configuration about where they've got the GPUs where they installed, uh, it's kind of useful, and it's more than useful for fingerprint. Okay, we found out what new ports were open at such uh, systems, and we found that IPMI is open. There's a protocol for some remote management, and it's uh, commonly used in out-of-bind uh, interfaces like uh, NBMC. 
You may be aware that in uh, IDMI we've got uh, a pack of vulnerabilities. Uh, they have been patched to a certain extent. But you know, if the system returns uh, a hash to you from uh, the user password you asked, and it's not closed because it's a part of a standard. So we've scanned that and uh, seems like it's here. It's here. This is the vul vulnerability of 2013 and there is nothing uh, surprising in there. We found it very commonly in the security assessment and uh, we have this communication with the vendor. Well, dear vendor, we've got this uh, vulnerability. Well, there is not a problem of a uh, of a vendor. It's a problem of a protocol. And normally the vendor keeps uh, saying, please use uh, complicated passwords. Uh, but we know the server returns uh, these complicated passwords. Um, of course, if you have got DGX, you can brute force it with, with the, uh, in, in a very short time. But still, would always have a question, only one question. This vendor reaction, well, you guys, please use uh, complicated passwords, complex passwords, because uh, we cannot remove this vulnerability, although you've detected it. Uh, it reminds me about some extreme biking, but wearing helmets. Uh, you know, it's going downhill wearing a helmet. But what do you need this helmet for? I don't, don't really know why they wouldn't want to fix it in the first place. We just uh, poked into those protocols a little bit more and uh, we found out that the certificate uh, had been issued by Quanta Computers Incorporated. Seems like that this uh, should be related to NVIDIA. But no, it's uh, somebody else's. We have extended uh, the search and it seems like that the quantum computers is the production is the producer of the servers and they do these boards so there's a guess that maybe nvidia in some of the releases has taken the bmc uh, plane without even changing uh, the certificate and you may be aware 90 percent of you have already understood that seems like that the serial number of this certificate is present on many servers on the internet how can this be for it's hard-coded one uh, to de-hard code it without dgx we just took the firmware from quanta computers which was very easy to find on the internet we <clears throat> unpacked that with Beanwalk and 7-Zip. Uh, very often the dealer, uh, uh, they would say we've got it all crypted, but very often we have the non-encrypted uh, non -encrypted version. We found the non-encrypted version for the obsolete models and we worked with it and the content is the same, but the encryption. This is what we did, and after we decompressed that non-encrypted uh, zip archive, uh, seven zip archive, we found where the keys are sitting. Of course, they have been hard coded, and uh, in the settings, they use pretty weak uh, cryptographic protocols. Uh, Tiffy. Diffie-Hellman primitive, primitives are used there, but you can take uh, the key and uh, just uh, decrypt it uh, in one go without uh, too much sweat. We've got this uh, firmware and we can grab it. We started grabbing it and found something very similar to Hashcom of admin, which uh, looks like a Linux uh, hash and we started thinking well if we've got DGX1 and we started having it by that time maybe we'll just brute force it on it we'll brute force all of these sysadmin passwords on it and we started uh, putting hashcat on DGX but unfortunately you know but always wanted to brute force it we checked on the internet and uh, we asked it seems like the request looked like that. Could you please uh, prompt us with the sysadmin password? 
in the BMC systems. Uh, and basically, Google provided us with a reply that the sysadmin password is super user, and that's true. And they've got this password for Quanta server and in mega rack from Amy. a famous producer of uh, firmwares and BMCs. It's easy to add 2 plus 2. The system had been assembled by Quanta, but they use AMI's uh, server, uh, uh, software, AMI's software. We tried that password and we drilled down into a system with the sysadmin rights. Uh, we started getting bored uh, by that time, but still we decided to work on it a little bit more, and we found a set of passwords which are used uh, for the IPMI authentication. These are the hashes, hashes that uh, are pulled out through this 2013 vulnerability, but they are encrypted here. It seriously says encrypted, oh yeah, of course, and we thought that it may be related to encryption, and if it's related to encryption, we need to do some decryption. Well, there were two ways we chose. One of the teams decided to reverse that, and somebody really lazy used this unique uh, grep uh, feature, and they found that there are two files uh, with this password, MegaRec. MegaRec is a password line in these files, and those reverse guys figured out that this uh, Password can be read through these files, and uh, it uses Blowfish without initialization vectors. There's nothing else. It's just a very direct encryption. It's related to uh, APMI and its features, but um, I would definitely like to give you some advice, uh, give you some advice based upon what's uh, been done. And the lessons learned are simple. Please don't use any... Uh, one-way uh, hashing with salt. Uh, please use uh, plain text passwords or reversible encryption. Password encryption key should be hard-coded and uh, should not be you know, just pre-installed and generated. It should be hard-coded and should be stored in the same folder as the user database that you are attempting to decrypt in case you forget. And it's also important to keep it uh, like the product name. Uh, if there's some troubleshooting going on, you can easily remember it. And if something uh, breaks in the system, please store it in the several places uh, across the file system. It's just done for resilience. Uh, so who am I uh, to explain all these things to one of the leading companies like Amy, how to keep secret a real secret? Uh, we've also been able to find out that uh, remote KVM is the uh, re remote KVM, mm, the keyboard access system, is using the RC4 key with the hard coded uh, key. EDC, mm, C, F, E, D, C, B, A from, zero to, uh, from 9 to 0, not from 10 to 0. And they are using an insecure random number generator. So basically, all of the classic uh, cryptographic features are present here. And you, I may be laughed at right now. You can start laughing at me. But seriously, there are plenty of scripts in the web interface uh, which are a vulnerability to cross-site request forgery, which we reported to the vendor just in case. Why? Because through this vulnerability, you, you, you can use different vulnerabilities as like an excellent uh, uh, upload feature in DGX uh, when the system checks uh, which key has been used for signing and actually the digital subscription, uh, di 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 digital signature is checked and verified. This key is used to verify firmware signature. And the web interface uh, together with CSRF, you can 
upload yet another uh, uh, firmware signature and you take your fake firmware, you take CSRF uh, firmware through this uh, browser and you can upload this firmware there and oops, uh, it, it works and you've got this BMC patched uh, all of a sudden. So, but the most interesting vulnerability there, the combination of vulnerabilities, we actually found out that there is a secret function which is uh, used another function which is called uh, file upload and voila, it uh, uploads files into the system. But if this file does not end up with a hash, I'm, I'm sorry, <coughs> if it, uh, if I'll put it differently. If the name of the file ends with a slash, that's what I mean. It's perceived as the name of a path and uh, you can uh, rewrite uh, random files. So these random files uh, were randomly and urgently selected and we uh, rewritten them. Here is, a, here is an example, a kind of a boring one. We have this, we have this session for CSRF. Uh, we create a specially trained file, like I said, which contains all this uh, password hash. And through this vulnerability, we put pass wd and shadow and we have a new account on the server and this new uh, we have the shadow and uh, we use this account just to directly break it break there through ssh Well, it's time for us to break in, I guess. That's it. Uh, here's our ID and uh, we are root. Here's a list of vulnerabilities and list of fixes, uh, which has been fixed by NVIDIA. And uh, I would like to thank Maria, Denise and Raman for working together. It was fun. NVIDIA has DGX1 and DGX2 and DGX A100 for $200,000, a great, great piece of hardware. Maybe it has some vulnerabilities there too, but we don't know anything about it yet. It's an interesting moment uh, which is related to disclosure timeline and how this vulnerability had been fixed. Uh, we initially found it and we found those vulnerabilities in September 2019 and in NVIDIA in actual fact uh, reacted pretty quickly. Their product security incident center responded on time and uh, they spoke business. They did not start saying no, you guys are wrong, it's not a vulnerability, but we wanted to release that uh, on Kiosk Communication Congress when we could visit Germany back in the day, but we were asked not to do that. Uh, and uh, we chatted with Alexander Matrosov, who I hope is still working in NVIDIA, but at that time he worked for NVIDIA and he said, Sergio, don't do it. Well, okay. And then COVID-19 hit and uh, the, it led to the cancellation of PH days and off zone. And then uh, NVIDIA patched the vulnerabilities uh, uh, and we did just decided to explain how it all happened. Uh, and we are grateful for them for that. Uh, it took them the whole year to patch that. What was the reason? Because, you know, the supply chain is really a painful thing because they needed to contact a few vendors for uh, QCT, Quanta Technologies, uh, and Army so that they would uh, remove the vulnerabilities from their 
products. And if you take a look at the slide, we have other vendors, uh, server makers, they've got the similar vulnerabilities, but we have not tested this yet, so I'm not sure about that. What are the conclusions? Uh, what conclusions can we make? If you have a real big thing, it does not necessarily mean that it's got great security, because we know that all of the things are made with artificial intelligence, and excellent uh, experts in machine learning <coughs> are bad experts in cyber security. It's obvious that all of the vulnerabilities are important, and even the weaker ones uh, combined uh, in a chain can result uh, with very, very sad results. Uh, the supply chain is a pain. And, you know, it, it takes quite a long time to convince other vendors, vendor, vendors to fix it and patch it. Use Grinder. I'm running out of my time, and I'll just be making a few announcements uh, of uh, some other interesting researches made by the team. The research by uh, Roman Palkin, which is about the specifics of uh, the work of machine learning frameworks and uh, how we can input the uh, adversarial code there to the pre-trained models. Uh, so you can find all this information on the internet. So I'll quickly run through these slides, quickly run uh, TensorFlow, Keras, how you can malware all these guys. Uh, so I won't just repeat, it's easy. And yet another research, uh, which is an ongoing one, is conducted by Maria. It's a research related to the medical images, uh, medical imaging. They focused on that because machine learning, especially computer vision, is very commonly used in medicine. But if you can break this pipeline, which uh, feeds the image uh, from the uh, MRI scanner, you can damage uh, the patient's health. It can be a very uh, modern option of the contemporary ransomware, which is an evil thing, but you know, the criminals are evil people by default. This presentation will be presented here later at one of the standoff sessions. So welcome to join Maria and her story later during the day. Yet another thing uh, which has not been released uh, by us yet, but it's a very interesting one, which is related to the biomet biometrics uh, and related to the facial recognition uh, on uh, for everyday use. Uh, uh, related to COVID-19, uh, it became very interesting, very popular, just, you know, to impose this big brother watching you, let's just watch all those breaking the quarantine laws, not wearing a face mask. In Moscow, it's a big uh, thing. Uh, Moscow has uh, the big, one of the best uh, uh, face recognition systems uh, worldwide, and uh, there are plenty of cameras installed. It's not a research, uh, it's just a pre pre-announcement of this research and how this system really works. Uh, we're just simply showing uh, how this system works in real time. For example, I'm a person wearing glasses and a face mask like it was supposed to be uh, walking, especially in April when this paranoia was growing. And some of the systems were, wouldn't even be able to identify the key areas in my face. But some of the systems would detect me, but they would detect me and they would identify incorrect features. For example, I'm, a no, I'm not an attractive person to, with which I radically disagree, of course. And if you take a look at the face recognition, in fact, with some entry data, having this rowboat uh, wearing a mask, uh, the probability that me is me is less than the probability that me is another person. 
You've got some other mo moments which are related to the biometric database, but I don't have time to explain this. I have to wrap it up. So I I'd better... Uh, oh, one more thing I would like to mention. A lot of biometric attacks, uh, they already have a huge history, and my favorite uh, presentation was at the uh, Biometric Congress, uh, is marked with this link. Please watch this video on YouTube. Uh, when those guys uh, could read the information on the reflection on, the, on uh, your pupil, when they would take and analyze the fingerprint of the Minister of Defense of Germany. So biometric is not the uh, authentication. It's an interesting thing. I have a course on artificial uh, intelligence and machine learning, and there are some hints about this to be released. I published in an article about uh, how practical this digital quarantine can be, and you can Google this article, but it's in Russian. Uh, what can we do? Uh, my presentation was just... Uh, a general one, but for researchers, I should say that uh, cybersecurity is greenfield. You can dig out quite a lot of things there, and you can, and you should not just be digging this at the level of the mo mo model, because this uh, model and how it's implemented and some specific practical implementations of artificial intelligence uh, and how to make the adversarial example for a road sign. Everybody does this, but you can think about it differently on how to break a, a vehicle uh, and protect it later on. For enterprises and for states, please don't trust AI and machine learning anywhere where the adversarial input is possible. Where the input data can be man manipulated with because we don't really know where it can explode and how we can be protected from that and please don't forget that you should not be just focusing on the modal <coughs> protection all the classical infrastructure still remains for governments uh, standard idea of mine centralized data and annotation so that it, it does not uh, go through all of the internets uh, like uh, the research facility A and facility B are doing this and that, please uh, make sure that uh, they focus on security. Like NVIDIA, for example, they bought a huge server uh, with lots and lots of um, issues and vulnerabilities. And please think about how machine learning can be used against you. There are plenty, plenty of abuses. There's a huge list and it's still growing and we can trust uh, less to everything what's happening online. And right now I would like to close my presentation exp where I was explaining that uh, AI and uh, the Internet uh, are very dangerous and it's better to separate them and I'm open for your questions. Thank you, Sergei. Uh, Thank you, Sergei. An excellent presentation. Uh, a lot of food for thought and, uh, you know, about questions, I think our participants uh, have digested uh, your story and uh, maybe they'll, they'll just try and uh, use their machine learning uh, systems and they will come up with questions later on. Now, I would like to thank you for all of the work uh, you have done, uh, for all of the cases you have explained and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Thanks a lot. Uh, please contact me on Twitter by email. I'm open for your questions and I would definitely like to invite everyone interested uh, about these things. Uh, we are a non-commercial organization, so if you are researching this, if you would like to research it together with us, uh, please join us. For us, is a hobby. Have fun. Thank you, Sergei. Have a nice day.